this is a spoiler. You can't listen you know. to this and not have spoilers. Okay, so Fo, we start in a letter form, and Susan Barton has been cast away from a ship and lands on a small, shitty island with two men, Friday and Crusoe. She has time there with them. She gets to see their simple lifestyle. She has a little like an affair, a sexual moment with Crusoe, and then they're saved like a year later, except for Crusoe dies and Friday is taken away off the island and they've and he's been there for thirty years. So she ends up carrying these people back with her to England and looking for someone to tell the story. And that's where Daniel Defoe comes in. Foe, the titular foe who wrote Robinson Crusoe. She's looking for an author. And so we've got this interesting side story. Like, that's what this whole hinges on. It's this alternate reality where, uh, where did uh, the story Robinson Crusoe came from? Well, it actually came from a woman who landed on the island and got to understand these, uh, the man and then came to tell his story and is looking for the story. Um, this, it, it's kind of hard to tell because it gets, the, the time is all mixed up. So she's writing these letters, but he might not have read any of these letters just yet. And before Susan Barton was looking for her daughter. And that's a story that we don't go into. We just see her being a castaway in the waves. She woke up in the water, um, I think is paraphrasing the beginning. And so she sees a little girl that doesn't look anything like her daughter, but claims to be her daughter, but also has her same name, Susan Barton. So it's like a poor joke or a weird setup and that it doesn't make sense. And she's trying to find foe, but he's running away from debtors. And she understands that he writes stories and has read some of them and takes up living in his house because he can't be there and takes in this, you know, Friday. She, she keeps Friday, doesn't know what to do with him. And we can go into all the relationships in a little bit, but basically she finds foe and is able to impress upon him her story and they have an argument themselves. And this is another part of the, the big part of this relationship because he wants to tell one story and she wants to tell another. And we have the matter of fact in our, the reader's world of the novel by Daniel Defoe, Robinson Crusoe. And we have her story and we know that Susan Barton is nowhere in uh, the other story. So in pairing out the relationship, you're wondering why did Susan Barton get left out? And we can talk more about that. I have some ideas, but I mean, so we have this whole side story where a woman was cast away and came back and told the story and is living the story you never heard of Robinson Crusoe and uh, how the story came to be. That's really rudimentary and it, I think it misses a lot, but um, is there any other things that stand out? Like the, the girl doesn't really get resolved. That's kind of like a, a mysterious part of chapter four, I think. So much doesn't get worked out within the book. And I think that it, I mean, I think you did a perfectly fine job of summarizing it because it's a difficult, I think it's a very, very difficult book to summarize. It is. Very difficult. Have, have any of us actually read the uh, original Robinson Crusoe? Yeah. You know, I read no. it when I was a little kid, like a, a little kid. And I remember just being confused by the language and, but I remember almost none of it. And um, have just gone like gone back and and read sections of it while I was reading this. And, yeah, I looked into it myself. Yeah, yeah and if fun. you like, if you watch Bunuel's movie, the 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 movie that Bunuel made is is kind of fascinating. <laughs> it's funny you it's, say that. I huh? I'd read it several times. I I had read it several times as a kid, and I remember it being really short. And when I looked up the the version of the novel, <laughs> it's it's four hundred and fifty pages. So I had <laughs> clearly read like a picture, heavily abridged <laughs> version of it <laughs> for kids. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I it was a constant question in my mind how much my lack of knowledge about Robinson Robinson Crusoe the novel was uh, impeding my understanding of this book you know what I wasn't picking up on because of not read it have, having read that one yeah there are only some points where I was wondering if my lack of knowledge was 
uh, not making me understand what was said. I think during Crusoe's death scene, one of the question marks I had, I think he had some sort of line as far as like Mahala or Maha, and I wasn't sure if that was some sort of uh, point towards something that had happened in the novel. I, I wasn't even actually sure if Friday was mute in the novel, to be honest. I didn't check that much out. Hmm. Yeah, I hadn't read the novel either. I mean, I remember having read it, but I was just young. It's like, I know that I read, um, I, I remember the covers of the books, you know, um, this is a wrinkle in time. I know that I've read it, but I couldn't tell you anything about it. You know, <laughs> um, And so, yeah, likewise, I wasn't sure about the details, but whenever I was reading this, I, I it didn't bother me. I just let that amplify anything that I chose, you know, could choose because I realized that it would have a larger backstory or that it's playing in that world. So you know, um, Friday just got to be more mythical because I knew that I could go and read a thousand words on him or something or a thousand pages rather. Cause it's a really long book though, isn't it? Um, rather than being short, I, I remember a big, um, a big hardback, uh, version. Uh, Robinson Crusoe. Yeah. Anyway. Talking about yeah. The book? Like yeah. I said, the PDF I downloaded was like close to 500 pages. Yeah. It's long. More, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I knew that there was so much more that was being like, and it's almost just kind of like to play with the language of the story and what it's about. Like that's the silence of having that bigger story looming as you read this one, because I mean, of course you can't help, but know that and know that coming into it. So what that brings, I, and I'm sure that it would be a much richer experience if you could have read the well, whole thing. I think a it. really important part of this is really what does the Robbins Crusoe story have to do with this? Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, I don't believe Friday in the in the original is mute, and I think that that was a, a strategy. That's it. You know, this whole book is focused on the power of language and um so i mean again i think we need to look at the fact that okay so you, whether you did read crusoe as a kid or you never read crusoe or whatever what does it matter really because i don't think it has a, yeah. as much to do with this story I, I think it's actually a pretty simple answer i mean like first well just to go back a little bit i do think that he was mute but just because I've seen the trope of a mute man Friday and other things, and it makes me you think, think he was mute in the original. I do. Um, I don't. I don't remember him being mute. I mean, I know that they had trouble communicating, but I don't. I don't remember that. Well, then maybe Crusoe cut out his tongue, and that's something that we. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like, that so. would be the answer to that. Then, if uh, uh, yeah. maybe there's a story where he was speaking. And Somebody Google that. <laughs> Did Crusoe <laughs> chop out Friday's tongue? That's, that's a question that Susan Barton wonders. She doesn't know. Yeah, she you know? doesn't know. And so I think that, like, you asked maybe a rhetorical question, but I think the simple thing of why we don't see Susan Barton in the novel and, like, why there's a story about this is, like, what she was trying to impart on him at the end in her conversation with him. She was – he was asking about Bahia. You know, you had a daughter. What did you do for work? Did uh, you, uh, like, have these fantasies that you'd be reunited with her and all that stuff? And she's like, I don't – look, that's that's my personal story, and that's not what I'm interested in making public. What I am interested in making public and having help actually excavating with the author is – this part of my life, which I can't even reckon with, I realized that I got a glimpse of a deep mystery because there's 30 years of history there and unsaid things that can't be spoken of. And I only got to glimpse it for a year and I'm carrying this with me now. Like I want someone to help me with this. And that's the story. And so I think that she has impressed on him the importance of being stranded on an island but I think that maybe it's a criticism of Foe because if you take the novel Robinson Crusoe to be the answer after this story, right? Like, let's just switch up the chronology here. Then mm -hmm. he left Susan Barton out entirely. And so maybe she would have wanted that, but I suspect that she would have wanted a little bit of the notoriety, a little bit of, I mean, she says that's what she wanted with that fantasy of being the castaway known about town. But, perhaps she still wanted to have her story be involved with it and to be completely exempted is the far swing of what she wanted. She didn't want to be the focus of it. She didn't want the Island to be a chapter in the book. She wanted it to be the basis of the book and perhaps her story be, you know, like, um, just, um, yeah. And not even really called into question. Cause that's not the story she wanted to go into. However, the confrontation with her daughter, I'm using air quotes, and, you know, wondering 
about her own identity and it's it, it's now I'm into murky territory because I think that that's opening up big big questions there. Well, like, I mean, I, no, I think it's. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go. No, it's all right. Go 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 go. So uh, her not ever making it into the story. When I got to the end of the book, and they have that that strange time, and it's not actually in the very last chapter. It's in chapter four. They have that strange time where she goes and meets him in his room, and there are all these kind of knowing looks around everyone, and all of these people. Right, he's at the really... table where he's at the table. And yeah, Friday's sitting eat? at the table. Right, but this is before that. This is when they oh. eat, and they had only brought oh. two dishes. And so uh, after she ate, she made a plate for Friday. I thought she didn't exist. I thought that she was his muse, that this was, uh, that this was about – that the entire book was about Defoe's muse and how we come to storytelling and what language has to do with – Exactly. Um, I, I totally agree with you. Can I quote from uh, Times about this, where they said, the operative forces are not so much history or politics as art and imagination. How can one individual story be apprehended and translated through language by another? In what ways do we project our interpretations onto others, especially in cases like Fridays, where muteness guarantees the lack of rebuttal? What responsibilities, if any, does an author have towards his subject material and sources of his art? Sources of the art, that's a, a New York Times discussion about this book and their focus like you're saying about what actually Coatsy is saying here t- discussing this is what b- bugs me is why is it, it doesn't bug me but it's just question I question like why is it in this Robinson Crusoe format or discussion or under that umbrella Cause... well when I when I looked at it that way I thought this was something that was uh, so it's old enough so that it's very otherworldly from where we Existed now. in the time that Coetzee wrote it, right. and or Coetzee, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm I've sorry. heard they actually Coetzeer, and that double e it makes an r sound, but oh, that could be okay. that could be some BS. I haven't confirmed it. Like it was just a teacher once. I also felt that Robinson Crusoe is a story that even if none of us has ever read it, everyone knows the story of Robinson Crusoe, and it has been used as the basis for many other stories and it is completely ingrained in our culture so the i think that the castle. yeah so i think that that makes it a little bit easier to use as a basis right for uh for a story like this so when i got to the place where i thought oh well she did she never existed at all she was you know for the time and for a woman of her standing she fell into bed pretty easily with both foe and with crusoe you know she did it for uh, you know it was a, a comfort thing for crusoe when he was had been so ill and then it was just kind of a given when she slept with him and mind you Friday's behind the curtain so and certainly for the time it seemed to me that like well this you know this probably isn't a real person this it seems more like a muse it seems more like this is you know she is visit he is visited upon by this woman yeah I really like that interpretation I'd have to let it dawn on me because I hadn't um uh, oh, I think so too. What did you think, Daniel? Not about the muse part, but just about the. Well, it it was a really interesting book. Um, trying to think about it and decide how to think about it, like you're saying, there's a lot of angles that you, that you could go. I did a little bit of digging around, and uh, one professor that I found talking about it, he spent so much time uh, talking about just the cover of the book alone. And it made me sort of uh, go back and, and really think about the role of the author and the decision to to tamper with the works of another author. And, you know, I was looking up, so Faux was a very conspicuous title. And then to play on, I always knew this author as Daniel Defoe. So I, I was under the impression that Coetzee had changed it. But apparently this guy, he was actually originally born Daniel Faux, and he changed his name to Defoe to make himself hmm. sound more important. Interesting. Yeah. But then you have that juxtaposition like right there on the 
cover of Coetzee and Foe, and it seems to sort of scream at this implication of the author, you know, and this uh, sort of uh, uh, that what's left out is like really focused on it. It, it it's almost like a relief. It, it's it goes into the silences that are being talked about. I think too, where there's this in the absence of, and this is kind of Friday's uh, ability. It, like whenever they you sit and like let the words come or there's that section where he's talking about the words if you're going like start to form themselves like there's this other place um that you get to so okay so this is like language and this makes me think of the dancing scene with uh susan barton whenever she was like really wet because she was kind of scolding friday for being uh into his flute and like not listening to her and like him not being able to listen to her like her concern about him not having language like to create a self with and all these kinds of things or to tell the story is a real big concern of hers and like she got mad at him dancing once but then later is really cold in a barn and starts dancing and feels this otherworldly euphoria makes contact with something that after she's dancing she can't express or remember anymore but feels the afterglow of being there and realizes that she's connected with friday or understands friday a little bit more because she thinks that she understands what he is getting at maybe sometimes in his life or why he sings why he dances and um and it has to do with something that is i mean if you think about the muse you know if this is really susan barton as being a muse not just for foe but also for coat z then then this is really interesting because he's able to as a being as a writer let's take the material person jm coat z you know he gets to go and be a woman on a castaway island for a little while you know he runs into things and questions about that but um he's able to explore and to go places um, I want to follow up on that, which you were talking about in, in terms of Friday and the um, him not being able to speak. Because I, I really think that this is like at the core, at the soul of this book, is Friday's in a Friday having no tongue. And uh, well, this is on page 133 of my version. Um, and I think, uh, yes, uh, Susan Barton is talking to Foe. She says, I think it's her. It might be folk talking. Whether writing is able to form itself out of nothing, I am not competent to say, I replied. Perhaps it will do so for authors. It will not for me. It's Susan Barton talking. As to Friday, I ask nevertheless, how can he be taught to write if there are no words within him, in his heart, for writing to reflect, but on the contrary, only turmoil of feelings and urges? And I, I just think that that really goes to the core of this book, which is that particularly when you make like one of the main characters mute and you're talking about muses and how, I mean, how, how can she be his muse? How can she, in other words, what is it that is in us that we express or can express if there are no words? You know what I'm saying? Like That's words like, like being of a self, pardon me? I, I said the primacy of a self. There's something right. like, there's like a basal line of being that you might not be able to even be in contact with because of words. And I think that kind of goes back to that silence thing, like letting the, the silences, I think she was scared of uh, as well with him and like found that she would like fill up the time saying things and he wouldn't really hear her, but he didn't really need to because she was just kind of saying things. It wasn't necessarily anything that he had to respond to or could respond to, or it was a kind exactly. of- Exactly. I mean, we don't know if he could, you know, like what, we don't know. I tried thinking about it and just, I've been trying, I've been working on this damn book for years. And I, after a while, I started thinking about it as Coetzee talking about the process of creating a book of cre or telling a story and of writing. And you get to the island and there is silence and there's this kind of, you know, curmudgeonly old guy who plods through his day and he is building these terraces, these whatever, thousands of rocks that he's building terraces and there's no seed for it. And I, I think about everyone, every one of us has written, every one of us knows that despair 
of feeling like the the, the field is fallow and that the the seed isn't going to be there and that kind of intense i don't know that arid place where and that despair of thinking i am never going to get this out this is never going to come out of me this thing that's inside of me that needs to come out that I, that needs to be written and i don't care if it's a term paper or a novel or anything it needs to come from inside of you and that barrenness is so acute when you can't get when you can't find the words when you can't when you can't pull it out and in the i thought that it was very telling that at the end in fact friday did learn to communicate he did perk up he he found ways you know he just survived when they were on the island and he did but he did interesting things throwing the flower petals that was an interesting thing that he did but he didn't talk about it and in the end he was writing he had a pen in his hand and foe is just lying in bed and says leave him alone let him at it he's just filled pages with o's which you know the letter o right. zero there's nothing there yet but it will come Maybe tomorrow you can teach him an A. And this is the way we move forward. We Crusoe built walls. He built something that someone could see later. You're there in the, you know, you're on the island. It's quiet and desolate and you're building walls. But that whole thing of how you actually get something together to how you actually create is a lonely uh difficult, arduous process. So that was, you know, in the end, which is also why I made her the muse. She she flits in and she brings something with her. She's very much alive. Even in her despair, she's very much alive. I think, um, sorry, go ahead, Daniel. No, no, I was just ruminating on that, sorry, audibly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to say with, um, with Friday and his muteness and with Susan Bartle uh, and it was Susan throughout the entire story struggling uh, to get her voice heard. I think it like points to the obvious, the obvious themes of uh, like women not having their voices heard and minorities not having their voices heard. And I think, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but this was written in, what was it? 1986 in 86, 87. Yeah. Yeah, and Coetzee is South African writing in Apartheid, South Africa, of course. So there's that. Wasn't he tension. criticized for the, 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 the this book didn't address the political cause issues mm -hmm. in South Africa at the time? But it, in a you know, of course, it's not explicitly political, but it does it does bring up those themes of certain groups not having their voices, and it also brings up the language aspect. I know during the island, Crusoe mentions, um, what was it, bring firewood? And then Susan responds, bring wood. And Crusoe says he only understands firewood, not wood. And this idea of language being this control, this power tool that is used mm. to, explicit, uh, you know, to, to control other people that, that runs throughout the theme. I think uh, Foe at one point says, isn't it nice that Friday doesn't speak because you can make him, I forget it's feel or do or want anything that you, that you want him to do. Yeah, I think you're, I, I think you're right. And I think that it's very political in that way. In that, in that we all know what is the actual outcome, what, ha what actually got written in the book. She's not in it. And Friday is a slave who does Crusoe's bidding. It's true, but I'll, to push back on that a little bit. So one of the things I read was that he was criticized for this being insufficiently political for a time when some very intense things were going on. Like Cesario was saying, we're coming, they're coming to sort of the climax of apartheid and, and the end and Mandela being freed in 91, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure. But, um, Apparently, there were critics or South Africans uh, who felt that this was, uh, in some way, sort of an author intellectualizing forces that were very political on the ground, but that this was a book in its heavily symbolic and subtle kind of format 
that didn't address these issues in a way that was communicable to the broad base of people who were experiencing this sort of political landscape on the ground. And that I, I can, to some extent, understand. In a way, this book, it's for a highly literate uh, readership. It's not really a book, even though I will say one thing I really love about Coetzee that I loved in uh, Age of Iron, which Nathan also had us read, is that his prose is really lean and it's very, very deep while still being lean. I can't really think of another author who I can think of off the top of my head that marries those two things the way he does. But I don't know. Yeah, so that's all I'm suggesting that there may be some validity to that claim, or at least it's at least it's worth uh, investigating whether it's political enough in that sense and being democratically accessible to people who might have needed some political assistance. I mean, sure, but at the same time, that brings us to the whole, you know, is the novel a political tract, which I don't mm. know if someone has more deep opinions on that. Like, what are the expectations? Yeah, yeah it's fair to precisely. For something to be at the same time encompassing and general, you know, mm. enough to be like, you know, I, I don't think that it's not a newspaper. It's not for everyone. It's just uh, doing the the furthest that you can on something. You know, I think there's been a lot of criticism with like the scientific community and like their publishing and, and certainly like, you know, philosophy gets a lot of this, right? Like for not being understandable. Um, and that's, I think that's one kind of thing. You know, I think there's people who are, people say that people who can't do teach. And I, I think that's absolutely wrong. I think that there's people who can teach and that's a, uh, that's a skill. And then there's other people who can do a thing, but they cannot teach. And that's a, like a, a failing in the other way. So being able to make something is one kind of thing, but then being able to take an argument out there or to turn minds around in your own lifetime. I mean, I, I think so much about like when we've read, um, you know, Kafka to not be really understood in your own time is I think the game of writing. Uh, it, you, you write kind of for the, the ages and hope that something sticks if you're doing it well enough. As you know, I don't ever read anything about the book while we're reading it, but I find it odd. So I just looked up, Mandela was released in February of 1990. This was written in 86 and 87. And I wonder how much, I mean, if, if you wrote a novel right now, would it have to be highly critical of neoliberalism? Would it have to, I mean, do you have to save people with every book that you write? I mean, just because you're an American, do you have to, how many apologies are you going to make but for Trump he, today? Didn't, he have a, didn't have a history of? He had a um, history of being against apartheid. Right. So, but being vocal about that political position, obviously. Does he have to do it in his art? I mean, does it no, have to? No, he doesn't have to, but I think that, that he had a pretty strong history of that. And that's one thing that critics jumped on. I'm not saying he has to. I'm just saying. I just think it's an odd thing to criticize. Well, one thing I would maybe, not that I'm standing behind this, but I'll just put it out there. Um, this is to piggyback on something you guys were also talking about on the Baldwin call you just had, which I thought was great, by the way. So I was having a conversation about Andrew Jackson with a, a guy the other day. He was talking about, he was making a similar point to the one you were making about Baldwin in the call, Mary, that it's necessary to view people within the context of their time and to criticize them based on proper expectations about what they could have actually been aware of and really understood in the, in the context in which they lived and to not sort of, and it's sort of unfair to foist historical norms and standards on someone who obviously couldn't have been aware of those standards and therefore couldn't have lived up to them. But Jesus, um, Jackson? Well, yeah, okay. So he was a fucking devil, that. man. But, 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 so I agree with that basic thing, but it, it seems also conceivable to me that as you're, as you're saying now, the criticism of these figures from our particular standpoint might also be a kind of self-deterring process. Like that may not be fair, but at the same time, it's conceivable that vocalizing it now in this context may be a part of our setting ourselves apart from it. You know what I'm saying? Like, if we emphasize so strongly that, yeah, they should be uh, taken in context and not criticized, it, it may be that vocalizing our own uh, critical distance from that gets left too much to the side that we don't sufficiently engage in that process today. You know what I mean? 
Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I understand that, but I, I feel like this novel is super ahead of its time, and I'm, I'm obviously reading it in the context of today, but like what I get from the character of Friday and from the character of Susan is Coetzee or Coetzeeer, in a way saying that he can't speak for these characters, you know, and he can't bring out Friday's voice. And I think the only agency that he gives to Friday is his uh, six-note flute playing, his dancing, (laughs) and the one time he throws those petals into the water. And in the same sense, Susan, that, like, it's constantly the problem of not being able to speak for this person. And I think that in a sense, relates back to this essential nature of Susan being a woman and Friday being, uh, you know, a, an ex-slave, uh, a black man. Yeah, and and he and the two characters that he, that you're proposing, uh, Cesare, that Coetzee is saying he can't speak for, are the center of this novel. They are the center, the primary characters of this novel <laughs> that he can't speak for. But he does speak for But he does, and he doesn't. I mean, he does in sort of a, 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 a sort of the opposite way by not doing it. Like he can't, like he can't, so we, I guess he attempts, but... Um, maybe doing the best he can in the form of language to point at that, that fact of speaking for someone else and make it conspicuous. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference between trying to walk in someone's shoes and like assuming that you you you're in their skin and know and can speak for them. And in that way, I see him really trying out some of the things that you know. And maybe this is just like a creative thing, but when you know they were talking about Susan Barton about being a writer and what it took to really just go there and like where language could take you and how things could like come of themselves. Like once you started going, it it seemed like a process of discovery that is helpful and and not in a way that's proscriptive or trying to tell you that this is the circumstances of these people but open up the door to the unknown which i think that he tries to do with with friday and like i see that there's a lot of respect for his character in this world not necessarily that you see it from susan barton but in their relationship together and in the way that the story kind of bears out their relationship you know friday gets the last word in the end. And I I was looking for this little bit, but it said it explicitly something like the story won't be over until we can find a way by art to give Friday a voice. That's paraphrasing. But I think that, you know, the horror of it, that she can't look in the mouth of us, you know, that a slaver cut out his tongue and that she won't let him go back to a plantation. I mean, these are very real concerns of the time that surprised me as details, uh, just because I don't know, you know, I don't know when uh, Robinson Crusoe was written or when this was written. You know, I didn't uh, take in that background stuff. I just took it for what it was. And to, to hear those horrors, it seems like they're really considered and thought out the... Um, the dangers of slavery, you know, it's, it's, it seems very political in that way um, because it's, it shows how ugly it can be in a, in a true way without being very pointed. And yeah. And here is the South African writer writing in South Africa and making the one Negro black man in this story mute. Yeah. I thought um, in the sense that uh, the, the novel contextualized it to um, the 18th, century that it was supposed to be written in was important in the sense that like Susan was in a sense a terrible person by today's standards right I mean um, uh, when she was on the island she I think she continuously thought you know she she mentioned how like ugly Friday was she would wash the things that he touched Um, she wondered why he didn't find her attractive as a woman continuously complained of him as dumb but still held this essential human nature of him as as not being able to sell him off to slavery Hmm. or give him up to slavery and one of the things i found so striking about that relationship was you know i mean they're literally stranded on a desert island together you know he's one of only one other person besides her on this island and despite that sort of you know, what you'd probably think of as a sort of claustrophobic proximity, there's still this just massive gulf between the two of them. There's this massive chasm of incommunication that to me seems to, it's not sufficiently explained by his lack of speech in any way. I mean, there are so many ways. I mean, I mean, we know very well that in face-to-face interaction, 
the actual spoken language is a, a rather fractional part of communication that goes on. I mean, body language and gesture and, you know, probably other sensual information, you know, is a huge part of it. And so it seems almost consp very conspicuous to me that no other form, at least until the end of the novel of communication is really given much credence. You know, it almost seems like, you know, she's pretty much avoiding the possibility of him being able to communicate like Faux says in order, or, you know, like Faux, Faux suggests, or maybe as Crusoe that suggests, uh, you know, wanting to retain the ability to put words in his mouth and to think of him in the way you want to think of him. When she does feel like she wants to communicate with him, when she tries and she goes and tries to make music with him and then can't do the, the, six, the six notes that he does over and over again and changes the tune and thinks that that will bring them to a better communication. I thought about how what she was doing was simply by rote and it wasn't actually trying to understand what he was playing. She was trying to bring him assimilate, you know, she wants him to assimilate into her understanding of what communication is. And there were all sorts of things that he did on the island that she didn't try and understand. She didn't, you know, she didn't try and understand what he did with the flower petals. She did, you know what I mean? I, I felt like it was. Yeah, I think that was the one where she really did wonder at the flower petals, but mm -hmm. all, all along she was trying to make him you know like convert him or she was doing it for herself and was outraged whenever he didn't notice her playing and she realized that he wasn't really paying attention to her musings on the <laughs> and no pun intended but like on the flute to try and like get his attention he was locked into some other place and she was just a passenger like along with that it wasn't um, a communication between them like she thought because she mm -hmm. saw it as like this one-way thing you know, but she also thought that like, I thought it was funny whenever she was on the island with Crusoe and she was wanting shoes and she went ahead and made shoes or whatever and they didn't like quite fit right. And Crusoe, because he wasn't making, it was taking days, but he was on his own time. Like that's what I'm trying to get to the point of with Friday too as a character. Like it's not just that he's mute. It's also that he was stranded on an island for 30 years <laughs> with another guy and they had uh, no enemies. Um, <laughs> I, I like that line. Like they... They had been turned. And so we all think about Crusoe, the man on the island, but like there was another man going through another experience on that island too, who was equally bereft of society. And like, so where Crusoe was like more curt and literally died whenever he tried, you tried to like take him off the island. You know, he was sick in, in that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know. And interestingly, uh, Friday did not die when taken off of the island. He adapted. He adapted to to being with Crusoe. So that's, that's an interesting uh, point to look at too. Just It just reminded me of that part, which again, I forget, but it was uh, when Susan asked about how do you um, teach or how do you um, discipline Friday? And uh, Crusoe mentioned something about laws are for immoderate desires, which, uh, and there are no immoderate desires on the island. So therefore, uh, you know, punishment is not necessary. Interesting. They're definitely not on Fantasy Island. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That could be a line for that, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so if Barton is a muse, that makes me think that the daughter is a conjuring of foe. That this is almost like a world where um, the uh, Star Trek holodeck or whatever, where he made a copy of her memory and it's not right. And she's like, no, this isn't my daughter. You got the eyes wrong. You know what I mean? Like you can say, and like I guess I could pretend that this is my daughter if that's what we're doing. But Wait, are we are we con <laughs> are we concluding that Foe brought the daughter in? Well, I got I have one line for this, and I thought it was again my thesis about how this is all about how you know men you know men have a terrible way of speaking for women, and when they create these women, they're all the same. And if you recall that her daughter had the same name as her. And there's this line which, sorry, on my Kobo e-reader says 0%, so that means nothing, but it says, you are <laughs> father-born. 
You have no mother. The pain you feel is the pain of lack, not the pain of loss. What you hope to regain in my person, you have in truth never had. That was, yeah, I thought that was just an incredible line, too. I love that, the idea of father born, which means that, you know, a male author created right. you. Right. And, it, and the little girl says, look how alike we are. And, you know, put her hands in hers and her, they were nothing alike. And the other thing is that after this time, I think the daughter's too, too young. It's like she yeah, is straight she from memory, daughter. from an, uh, you know, from an old memory. And the conjuring is especially notable when he brings them into the, you know, they go to his boarding house, wherever it is that he's living, when he's not living at his house, he brings them in. But also there's, you know, there are parts of you, as you write a story, there are parts that come in and entertain you and then you take away, you write them out. I mean, I think that there are some aspects of this that are just very much about the process of creating fiction. And it, you, what what are you going to consider for for characters? And and you know how is the action? You know the the time that Susan understood Friday was when she went into a trance, like Friday went into, and it was action. It was her taking action, and that is always something when you're writing that you you know action moves your story and. She couldn't, you know, she was blissed out by it, by actually acting of her own volition in the story. So, And really writing. You know, she said you know, how easy it is to write. I never knew until I started to do it, you know, and like starts to second guess foe. And you get the idea that she actually would be a better storyteller, perhaps, because her letters aren't bad. You know what I mean? Like her letters are written interestingly. And, uh, Although she does write to him in the beginning about how difficult, like, oh, my, you know, the paltry information that I gave you, now that I sit down, I see how paltry it was, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but, he's also but, at the same time trying to make, you know, the point that if you, it, it just seems boring, it's because you're missing, again, that silence. Like, you don't know what it was like to always hear the wind all day. Like, that's a, that's a hard thing to convey. And mm -hmm. if it seems like I'm not telling you much, it's because that not much is so big. Yeah. Yeah, there's a big difference between experiencing something and writing about it, too, also. But the it, it keeps pointing to this importance of writing. And I always thought that, you know, those episodes of Friday dancing and uh, Susan dancing at one point spoke to this, like, um, possibility of experiencing things that are, uh, you know, apart from language. But at the end of the book... I mean, they're teaching Friday to write, right? It's It seems like he's saying it's an essential part of being is this being able to write. I kind of thought of that as him, him being elevated into a true character in the story. Because in the story, you know, in you mean when he Robinson to write? Crusoe. Well, in Robinson Crusoe, I mean, his, his eyes light up when she says something about him going, you know, when, when he... When Foe talks about him, well, you, you know, okay, you don't want to send him back to Africa. Have you thought for a second about maybe bringing him to some place in London where there are people who are like him, where he actually could communicate? Is this all really just about you, or are you actually concerned about him beyond his just life and death? Do you, or do you are you just dragging him around with you because you want this shadow? I love that part about the shadow. Does your shadow speak? And the uh, but when it came ta time that he was actually writing, I thought, oh, this is the this is the place where he's like he's turned it over. It's, it's not the story's not going to be about Susan Barton. The story is going to be about Crusoe, and it's going to be about Friday. Friday is like writing himself into the story. There, hmm. I could be very wrong. <laughs> I have flights of fancy while I read. Uh, well, it's like interesting, that. too, that he sort of leaves it there. To have continued on and had Friday learn to write would have required Coetzee, you know, or Coetzee through Foe to to really start putting more, more and more words in his mouth. I mean, before you have Barton kind of doing it and then Foe doing it to some extent. But then if it had gone on, Coetzee would have had to start doing it, too. And then, you know, everyone would have been putting 
words in Friday's mouth. So he at least Coatsy sort of begs off there and leaves it to the reader to suppose. Maybe because he thinks Friday is saying a lot, even without a tongue. Hmm. Or maybe it's the point where the actual writing of Robinson Crusoe begins. Yeah, so I, I see like this kind of like a three-part thing here going on. I think that all of these things are right. So in the one hand, he gives this character who can say a lot without saying anything uh, on the island. And then he gets language because people can change and like you can grow and like he was just deprived of it. It's not like he, you know, there wasn't a need for it or, or the, the uh, capacity to do it. And so, yeah, so now he goes and he does what he can, even if he doesn't have a tongue. And then you have this third thing, which is that if the Robinson Crusoe novel we know has a speaking Friday in it, and this story is an origin story, but Friday had not been speaking, then maybe it's that by the time Foe wrote the novel, he was in a relationship with Friday with language and was uh, his own Robinson Crusoe to Friday uh, as a as a talker and as a community, you know, uh, writing that into his own experience um, uh, into the novel. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah it, it makes sense. Idea. That makes sense. I mean, one of the things both I think as a writer and as a reader that you're required to do is sort of to fill in the gaps. And then I guess, you know, that's also part of just uh, experiencing to begin with, you know, in interpretation, but um, we do it in different ways. You know, I mean, as a, as a writer, you do it in words and you form things into an order of words into a, a narrative. And um, as a reader, you sort of are on the other end of things and you're having to sort of cash out that uh, symbolic code into experience and imagination um, and to what extent imagination is entirely built of experience is an open question for me. But um, I mean, that's part of what was interesting about this book. And, and it's an interesting question to me too, you know, the extent to which human beings are made of stories, um, you know, at curators of stories or of generative sort of constellations of stories that are sort of evolving over time. And to me, that has a lot to do with, questions about the self and things like that. And in, you know, a time now when the self is a much more problematic sort of idea for us, and we have people who are sort of taking different ethical stances on that. Um, I think it's a very interesting question to what extent stories are related to the self and to what extent we can sort of get by without them. That's a, that makes me Right here, there's a, a something from, from what you're saying, Daniel. Page 131, the, it says here, in every story there is a silence, some sight concealed, some word unspoken, I believe. Till we have spoken the unspoken, we have not come to the heart of the story, which is what I think is at the heart of this story. I ask, why was Friday drawn into such deadly peril, given that life on the island was without peril and then saved? But I, I mean, it, he does a, a long discussion at the, toward the end of the book about and silence. And in fact, this is my favorite line, but, you know, we'll get to that. But my favorite line is, because I have other ones, um, we must make Friday silence speak as well as the silence surrounding Friday. This is just such... Yeah, I can elaborate on that on 118. He Go says, uh, uh, many stories can be told of Friday's tongue, but the true story is buried within Friday, who is mute. The true story will not be heard till by art we have found a means of giving voice to Friday. That's what I was trying to quote earlier. Right. And the, and, and so what comes to me in terms of this as a novel, which is unconventional in terms of its structure and, and plot and, and characters, I even question still if the daughter was real, existed, was some kind of phantom. But it's it's kind of like because the central character, in my opinion, the central character next to Susan is Friday and he's mute and can't speak. And how do you write a story? I mean, think about it. If you had a film of someone who was mute, that would convey more in the immediate moment, because even if they didn't know sign language, they could move in some way, like when um, Friday dances. 
um, to communicate something, but in a, in a book, in words, it's harder. So I'm thinking, okay, what's coming out of this is really because of the curious structure of this novel, difficult structure of this novel, is it's really the poetry that we're seeing and what this is because even, you know, I'll be reading along, I was reading along and it was started, I think Susan asked Foe, she said, I think, I don't know where, I can't find the quote right now, but she asked him, oh, here it is. Before you declare yourself too freely, Susan, wait to see what fruit I bear. But since we are speaking of childbearing, has the time not come to tell me the truth about your own child, the daughter lost in Bahia? Did you truly give birth to her? Is she substantial or is she a story too? I will answer, but not before you told me. The girl you send, the girl you call, who calls herself by my name, is she substantial? And I was like, why is he using that word substantial? What exactly is Coetzee trying to say here, trying to convey here by using this word substantial? And then I started thinking about the larger picture of the book, putting aside the specific issue of the, of the girl. And I was thinking, this is really a poem. This is poetry. This is not a novel, a traditional book. Um, and, and then that brings me to this question, which I wanted to ask everybody, because it's fucking driving me crazy. What do you think about the last chapter? Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I thought I, I, I read a, the, a New York Times review of it, I think, uh, from the time and it mentioned something uh, elusive, like it's the poetical voice, which I didn't mm -hmm. understand at all. And uh, the only thing, way yeah, I can I make sense of it is uh -huh. uh, if it's Coetzee himself walking around his imagination because he seems to set the scene in several different ways and he walks around the kind of story but he has the same character stillborn in a certain sense I think Friday uh, is the only one he, the, the, it ends with Friday having you know speaking but he's underwater and bubbles are coming out of his mouth but I mean he shows up a couple times and so does Susan and so does Defoe but they're uh, still solid, um, dry, and I feel it's like him kind of walking around the scenes of his mind and picking out what he's going to make of the stock characters that he has. Yeah, but when I when I was looking at it and I was thinking, okay, if I look at this as a traditional novel, which it isn't, but let's just say, <laughs> uh, and I look at it from that point of view, I'm like, okay, they're all dead. They're yeah. all dead. Uh, yeah, okay, I mean. that's what I got. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think what's happening is that, that you're seeing this um, overlay of time. I, I'm trying to find it and I can't, but there's this moment where Friday goes into a trunk that has MJ on the initials. And I believe that's J.M. Coetzee's material. I think that he is there in the same space, just not in the same time. And this is that... You know, so before everything is in quotes, you know, it's all the letters and then it's all. Um, yeah. and, and then to have this, I, it, as much as I can understand the disgust of that poetical voice, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> that, that it breaks out from that and becomes this other, and it is that exploration. Yeah. So, I mean, yes to what you're saying there about um, uh, Foe uh, in his own in mind with this. And, and I think that, that that point right there can be taken to the whole novel. I think that. Right. What's that exploration of taking on somebody's shoes again, or, um, you know, each of these explorations, it's just more focused, but here I think that the, the reins are really let off and that's the attempt to give Friday a voice at the end that he does by going deep into the unknown, the place without words. This is a place right. without not words. And, um, well, and in many ways, I mean, this is a shockingly massively difficult if not near impossible thing to do to write to write in language using words on written written on the page uh, a character who's mute i came away from it thinking that what we were seeing were the husks when you any big project that you've ever done they all have they basically have a life cycle and when you get to the end of it there is you know what is left is are, are these husks of w everything that was as you got through the project and i thought oh this you know you've you're done reading the book and you know what's left is just gonna it, it could be blown away in the wind 
because you're done with it. You're done with the with the process and you're done with the project and you have these husks there. And there is a death to it. You're done with a book. You're done with a whatever, a program. I, 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 I don't disagree, but is, is how satisfying is that for the reader? For the reader. Again, I, and I guess this goes to what Daniel was saying about how this really is an effort for sort of a higher literary, you know, exploration as opposed to just picking up a paperback at the supermarket. Well, yeah, but I mean, are you are you not interested in? I mean, you don't read the whole book if you don't want to go through the process of figuring out what it's like to write a book. This remember this reminds me. I was thinking when I was when I read the last paragraph because we were I was editing some discussion we had, and now I can't remember. But Cesari was talking about it's probably the state of the art. Um, uh, episode and I think Cesari was talking about how you okay. know how it is when you're reading something and then you get to the end of it and you find that it was all a dream it was all the main character's dream right or mm -hmm. something I mean I there have been tv shows that have done that that have like so lame it's so fucking lame. <laughs> and but I didn't think that this period. was lame in that way. But but at first, that was my first thought because I was still looking, I was still like living in that traditional novel structure way. <laughs> and then at that point, I was like, fuck, you're kidding me. But then when I set, stepped back and I was like, well, wait a minute, this is not what's happening. This is not what this story, this book is about. This is not what, you know then I, I could see the deeper, more profound layers of what was happening. But still, at first shock, at first moment, I was like, fuck. <laughs> but yeah. I, it's not it's not as simple. Obviously, that's not what it is. But I'm just saying it, it, it kind of it kind of it was fascinating. It was just, and it said to me, actually, it said, you know, it it, it um, broke open the uh, profound um, effort that Coetzee was 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 making here. One yeah. thing that sort of comes to mind is that maybe he's sort of making uh, an effort to expose himself at that end point there by sort of coming out from behind the different narrators and speaking in a voice that can't belong to any of them. He's sort of exposing him himself and his own voice um, in writing in case he hadn't made that suspicious enough, he's just hammering it home there. Like, which right. You could sort of see as an ethical maneuver in a novel that has spent all of its pages basically raising the issue of voice and authority. Right. Yeah, definitely. This is, um, I mean, something that uh, without spoilers for his other novels, I think Age of Iron is an exception to, to that really. Um, Age of Iron was much more like a straightforward novel um, with beauty in it, you know, in its own poetic way. But we we talked about it last time, but like Elizabeth Costello is linked with Slow Man um, and the and the Diary of a Bad Year is unlike any other structured, unlike any other book that I've read, mainly because each page is broken into three parts by lines. And so you can read. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this is like I see as an exercise, I mean, um, and we get to see the fruits of it. You know, it's messy, but it's like uh, the thing about novels that they're the question, you know, not the answer. Right. So it's like that that going on that walkabout with someone else's mind as it takes in all the things that it takes in and tries to, you know, explore is amazing. Yeah. As an as an exploration of process, I found it absolutely you know really captivating in trying to whenever i try and write the the walls that you hit and that emptiness i really got i really felt that when i was reading this i really felt that oh I, you know probably everybody gets that <laughs> you are not unique in your lameness <laughs> yeah that's well, uh, great. Are, are there any uh, so didn't Faux present that girl to yeah, her? Uh, right, Faux but Faux, gonna... Faux foisted on her, foisted the girl on her twice. How does Faux know naked. this girl? Uh, yeah, right, maybe. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Like, how does he know anybody? Right, like he has right. all the stories of pensioners and debtors and hearing confessions of people. So there's the, the yeah, there's the other. Oh, that's why I I came to it thinking that it was 
that it was all about the process. Right. Here is, you know, it's, um, so I could, I could write, if I write the daughter in and there's a reconciliation, you know, the happy reconciliation that he talks about, he sends her back and she rejects her. So that's not the story. Right. It wasn't the truth, you know, so like right. story is flawed here as a writer within J.M. Coetzee's writer mind, because he yeah. meant the thing that was true for her. If you take Barton to be absolutely true um, mm -hmm. in her own right and that she knows her story. And then, you know, there's this invention to try and like fill the gaps. Um, if you sit that. back and just have a little daydream for yourself about your favorite novel your favorite story, no matter what it is. Lie back and try and put yourself in the mind of the writer and consider everything that they went through, everything that they left out, everything that they tried and failed, and which, you know, that thing failed, and what you come up with at the end. All of that sifting for gold. And the gold that you read left a lot behind there was there was a lot that went into it and yeah so that's i mean it's he's trying it out he's you know that that whole st the story of her uh, the story being about her and her daughter but she rejects her because she's not her daughter because it's not really the story the story is about robinson crusoe yeah well i i, I want to like add in i think that the the bundle with like the the dead girl child that she's oh, the part geez. of that yeah i mean i'm sorry to bring up the words i'm sorry i don't like having to say dead girl baby you know like just, yeah but, um but you know it's it reminded me of what was that story that we read where the guy has the nightmare about the like the the sexy baby or whatever um <laughs> you know it, oh it, it's right. that, it reminds me of like this is a manifestation of your uh, what, what was that again, Dostoevsky? And, um, punishment. Punishment. That was, crime and uh, Punishment. Was uh, that Crime and Punishment? I forgot about was, that. Wow, there's so much old... stuff in Crime and that one. Like, so many side parts. I, I tend to just think uh -huh. it's all in the cover. Sven, not Svengali. I forget his name. But... <laughs> Svengalov. Yeah, Svengalov. Yes. That's it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that was horrifying. And I feel like that was very similar to, like, I guess it really was a substantial body. But... Was it, um, but I mean, it was also playing right on these fears of hers, you know, that, um, that she's lost this, you know, child. Um, and it, yeah. It, and the, the trauma was something I was sort of wondering about, I guess that moment that you mentioned, Nathan, where Foe tells the story as if it's sort of this, uh, story of her losing and re being reunited with her daughter. And she has that moment where the air goes out of her. I thought, I guess, sort of naively that that was going to be her realization that this was indeed her daughter and that she had disowned her or not known her or not recognized her own history and daughter and everything like that. And it was going to sort of um, compound this uh, idea of uncertainty that even our own histories are in some sense, uh, our own inventions are not in our control, but that was in the end way too conventional because immediately he, obliterates any certainty that you would and she's just like no no i don't like that story it's yeah or puts the uncertainty in foe there i mean like so that she is certain but like or to the world that coatsy is created might be another way to like put it maybe that he had I, I don't know but yeah there's you know it seems like yeah well maybe she would just you know like go with whatever and she's an observer to this world but that wasn't the case like she has a substantial history that she must have had all along in order to be a point in the story or to have a perspective at all. She had to be a woman so that she could, you know, uh, like all these things form who she is. And yeah, and it made me think too of that, that, that whole, uh, the movie changeling was based on that phenomena where somebody returned a kid to her and yeah. we're like, yeah, it's yours. Yeah. It's yours. You're mistaken. You don't know better and, um, trust us. You know, and, and how frightening that would be to realize that there's a conspiracy to wrap things up at the cost of the truth. And um, what's, you know, she just, she really has lost her daughter and that's not resolved. 
but you know, you want to make it a neat story, you know, and, and say that there's this reunion, but that's just not. And I think that kind of goes back to the novel Crusoe. It's well, you'd like to think that uh, Man Friday is, you know, kind of maybe like an equal on the island without others, um, but in real life, in Foe's real and Coetzee's real life story of this, they cut out your tongue. And that's awful, you know, and uh, that's a part of the story that you're not getting right. It's not so easy to square or think about. One of the questions embedded there, too, I think is, so what is what is the thing that actually makes a story out of just a collection of events? What is it that manifests the story rather than just this chaotic mishmash of details and perceptions? Well, it was what Foe wanted to do. Well, I'm just talking in general. Yeah, and I'm saying in general, it's what Fo wanted to do. He wanted to create this story. He wanted to create drama. He wanted to bring in structures that she didn't want to bring into the story because that was not the story. She That was not what she felt was her story. But more often than not, whatever our story is, is not what's going to sell. Like her story that's... within that, with him telling that, yeah, okay. I'm sorry? Yeah, I guess that there's a couple of different stories going on in this because, you know, she has something to tell and there's and then there's the overarching one, which is this novel. So containing all these things. I mean, there's a lot of collection of events in there. And I, I guess it's like an up and down quality thing. Yeah, but, but I remember, Fo, I don't know where the quote was, but he said at some point he said, you know, I'm trying to bring in the drama to the story because he didn't feel like the life on the island was very interesting. That's right. Yeah, it's it's what does it make that makes it interesting to to you and to others, and that's why it's something that can be a story to me is not really much of one to someone else. Well, again, you have to think about you know are you writing the story for you, are you writing a story for others, you're writing the story for your family, you're writing a story for the public, and that's where it gets hard. Go ahead, start. I think like I a think podcast. yeah, I think it's prescient <laughs> in uh, in our modern day of new media where you can't just do things. You have to do things with the understanding that other people have to experience them as wonderful. Um, you know, well, I don't know if the word is wonderful or if rather if it's understanding. Significant, significant or, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a line early on. Uh, if the company of brutes had been enough for me, I might have lived most happily on the island. But who accustomed to the fullness of human speech can be content with caws and chirps and screeches and the barking of seals and the moan of wind. Right. Right. And I mean, like one of the first rules of writing is you got to catch them in the first paragraph, got to catch them in the first line. Yeah. The first gotta, 140 characters. You got, yeah, exactly. You <laughs> yeah. got to make it so, to the, so that they'll turn the page. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's something that the story deals with, and this is like a larger issue for us now. And well, I mean, I guess it was also in 1986 too, but you know, like, who are we talking about? When we talk about one or we like it's gotten to be a massive amount of people with, mm -hmm. Mary. you know, I have a hard time. Uh, Mary, we talked about that article I was trying to write. I couldn't get into who I was talking to because I kept taking in so many people to account and I would have to start from the beginning of the universe to get anywhere. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. to start out so general in order to be completely understood. And I, you know, it ended up driving me mad uh, versus assuming that everybody had. And that's part of this bubbling thing, you know, where you assume that everybody, you know, has parents or um, hasn't yeah. been a slave or something or, you know, d doesn't know like the most abject situations and you end up not being able to even imagine. So whenever Foe thinks that the island isn't interesting, it's because you really could not imagine it or you, you can't, you know, you don't know what that experience would be, or you think that islands have coconuts on them. Like that was a lot of like Susan Barton, you know, as a character had island fantasy stories and was saying that this is not like those. So, um, well, I mean, in reality, I mean, in reality, whatever reality is here, but when you think about, uh, the, the, what they, what we learned about the island at the beginning of the book, I mean, not much happened, right? Yep. It was a very boring place. It was very peaceful, quiet. You know, she made, you know had sex with Crusoe. She hung out with Friday. You know, it wasn't once. a big deal. And he she made sex with Crusoe once. Well, yeah, whatever. And it was wrong. more. It was like a. I mean, it was. Uh, she had sex all over this book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. She sleeps with Crusoe. She sleeps with Foe. I mean, I'm sure she slept with Friday at some point. Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think so. Laura's in the authority of reality here. There's but. the story. <laughs> I, uh, 
I, that's why I started thinking of her as a muse because of the of her climbing into into bed with foe and that she had you know for the time slept with the Portuguese ship captain right that, that's I mean, they actually, I mean I don't think she, they had like an, an affair I mean it was like more than just one night thing, right. right right interestingly if uh, that the sailors would actually throw her overboard or put them off in a boat mm-hmm that seemed to me to be the, one of the most far-fetched things that they would, you know, there was a woman, a sexually active woman, and they're going to throw, throw her away. Her away. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah ex- explicit, explicitly so. I think when she talks about Bahia, right, she says that, uh, what is the Portuguese girls leave the house twice in their lives for their uh, baptism and their funerals. Um, yeah, right. Everyone, right. everyone else is a whore, but luckily there are plenty of whores around. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, there's that superstition. I don't know how widespread it actually was, but you always hear of the superstition of women on ships back in the sailing days. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. It was you know, people were afraid it was bad luck, which was probably stemming from some sort of uh, socially disruptive situation that got stigmatized and then became superstition. Right, fighting over who gets to rape her next, most likely. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. In so many yeah, words. Right. Yeah. yeah. The obvious solution is to throw her overboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, guys, aren't we happier? <laughs> yeah, but I think even Foe says that. Doesn't he call her a dirty whore? And then I she, don't like, remember those words. I thought he was talking about know. himself in that passage, Lord. Maybe he was talking about himself. I think they were talking about writing and, um, you know, that. I have to find uh, that. Using yourself, basically, in order to, to pay. Because, I mean, this gets into writing for audiences, because that's, I think, the comparison yeah. of boring there was. Right. Uh, and that. And that's the point, right? That's what Foe was. Fo was. I mean, I guess he, if he was talking about himself, I can't remember. But that's what he was. That's what he is. That's I got to make money. Obviously, he wasn't doing a good job of it because he's in debt. <laughs> but, you know, that's what you a have to do. A lot of great writers lived in great poverty and never had. Yeah. But he wrote a lot. Defoe wrote a lot. But he did have debts. It was a, it was a very different world, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Different world, different. Yeah, I don't know how you can expect to be appreciated in your own time with your art. I mean, that's uh that's a that's a that's a real yeah, You know how you do it? You write the you write the next uh vampire sex movie. That's how you do it. That's how you <laughs> I mean, I'm it's, I'm I'm talking about today. <laughs> Unfortunately. I'm actually working on a fawning memoir of Trump, so I'm hoping that <laughs> <laughs> You know you'll sell at least one copy. Yeah, two. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, uh, maybe we should uh, 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 come back, uh, come back around, and um, anything else that we've got uh, that we want to launch out with or have last lines. Um, yeah, well, we could do some final uh, passages or or whatever. All right. Don't we go in alphabetical order, dudes? <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> me. I feel yeah. unfair, but yeah, I feel um. Uh, I think you're, right. Bit. <laughs> you're right, Daniel, that it does play on a lot of these postmodern tropes about uh, authorship and voice and who says what. But I think it does. I think it does a pretty good job of complicating it. But maybe I just say that due to the um, due to the context of you know apartheid South Africa that I give it that I give to it and a lot of like reading into it myself that I you know the agency I give to these characters you know Friday who has no voice and Susan who complains about not being able to write even though she writes beautifully um but at at the end of the day I really liked it my last line is on um it's really just the one sentence but I'll give the context on page 13 to 14 and this is Susan speaking Is it not possible to manufacture paper and ink and set down what traces remain of these memories so that they will outlive you? Or, failing paper and ink to burn the story upon wood or engrave it upon rock? We may lack many things on this island, but certainly time is not one of them. I spoke fervently, I believe, but Crusoe was unmoved. Nothing is forgotten, said he. Then, nothing I have forgotten is worth the remembering. Mm, That's a good one. All right, if I can do two of them, if I can be so permitted. Uh, the first little bit I wanted to read was uh, Chance had cast me on his island, Chance had thrown me in his arms. In a world of chance, is there a better and a worse? 
we yield to a stranger's embrace or give ourselves to the waves. For the blink of an eyelid, our vigilance relaxes. We are asleep, and when we awake, we have lost the direction of our lives. What are the blinks of an eyelid against which the only defense is an eternal and inhuman wakefulness? Might not they be the cracks and chinks through which another voice, other voices speak in our lives? Um, yeah, that was and good. That with was that good. sort of Cormac McCarthy article you guys mentioned earlier, which maybe we should link to since we've mentioned it a few times, that one really spoke to me because he seems to be mining similar territory. And since we uh, talked about the Sunset Limited, perhaps for a future thing, there was an there was a line in here that really sort of signaled to what I think is the heart of that work also, which I just wanted to read. There was two little, too little desire in Crusoe and Friday, too little desire to escape, too little desire for a new life without desire. How is it possible to make a story? Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And I can see what you mean by being the, uh, the heart of it. That's um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully we can explore that further. Yeah, I don't want to get into it now, but that's good. Mm -hmm. Oh, but one more thing I just wanted to say, I'm closing, um, to it, attack a little bit of what I said earlier, which is actually not my real position on this book. I, I do think it's sufficiently political and, and subtle. I think for critics, it's also very easy to jump on that angle, kind of like you were talking about, Nathan, where we can nitpick ethically a, a piece of art or a work um, for not being sufficiently uh, attentive to a certain perspective or this or that or not being overt enough, being too veiled, and then on the other side, being too not being uh, subtle enough. Uh, you know, I mean, you can come <laughs> at it from any different way you want to, and then you sort of in the end, at least I start to ask, well, what is this actually doing for the reputation of the person asking this? Is it not sort of a self sort of aggrandizement, elevating their own voice in the discussion now at the expense of someone who's actually tried to make something? Uh, so I, I, I do think that this work deserves its place. Because I mean, even Today, for me, you know, someone who is not very connected in their life to apartheid, it can speak to me ethically about that situation. So it has a range beyond its sort of imminent situation. The alternate ending was uh, Friday calling them all racists and, uh, <laughs> and then going on the TED Talk circuit. So, you know, <laughs> you know, that's it. Hey, Friday. Okay. Uh, you. Is it me? Yeah. Okay, I think I mentioned earlier that this is probably my favorite line. We, it's um, um, page 132, and I think it's, it's, I think it's faux. We must make Friday silent speak, as well as the silence surrounding Friday. That's probably my favorite line, but there is a passage just below that that I like too, which says. How can he how can he write if he cannot speak? Letters are the mirrors of words. Even when we seem to write in silence, our writing is the manifest of a speech spoken within ourselves to ourselves. And I think that's kind of a lot of what's going on in this book. Now, the other thing is that the last chapter really is an important thing to me. It's kind of freaked me out. I'm kind of living in a freaked out state right now. <laughs> and kind of going through the day like uh, jittery and uh, uh. anyway and and i think it i i still have i mean i think we could spend a whole three hours on just the the, the that chapter um and because i'm you know like i mentioned before part of it is very disturbing to me and freaking me out and the other part realizes that he, what it that, that what he's really saying and what he's been saying throughout this book and it is a poetic, I think, manifestation. But anyway, the first line in the in that chapter I really liked, which was the staircase is dark and mean. And the reason why I really liked it is because, probably because when I turned the page, and there I was, chapter four, the staircase is dark and mean. Whoa, that is a, a line that was character of line, quality of line that was not in the rest of the book. So. I mean, I really love that. And it's probably because of where it was placed, the drama of it. But at the same time, I just think that this last chapter 
just says so much about what Coetzee was saying or is saying in this book about writing, about language, about uh, mute, being mute, about men, about women, about muse, all kinds of things. I think it comes all out of this last chapter, which is, it's fascinating to me that it is, that it, it really does say that all that, but at the same time just freaks the fuck out of me. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's my comment, done. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it makes sense that it would freak you out that in so few words he could do yeah, all of that. He yeah. could do all of that, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I loved it. Thank you very much for yes, suggesting it. Was it. Wonderful. I really enjoyed it. I think that the only Kutsi I read in the past was given me to – was the book was an, uh, was Slow Man. And someone gave it to me who I – yeah, let's just say uh, wasn't a great circumstance. And I – and I read it and didn't take it in and then left it on the train for someone else to have. And so now I'll go back and get my own damn copy and, uh, <laughs> and read it Make again. It yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Context is all important. So the line that I chose was just something that I found really uh, beautiful and interesting because it spoke to me. It, it really spoke to me about the way that, I personally ins inspect the world in the, whatever circumstance I'm in. So she's writing to him. He's left the house and she's finally, you know, she's gone up into his attic where he writes and is, and finally has the vantage point that he had when he was writing. And so she said, um, she's talking about the physical aspects of it and says, there is a ripple in the window pane. Moving your head, you can make the ripple travel over the cows grazing in the pasture, over the plowed land behind, beyond, over the line of poplars, and up into the sky. And I, I really liked it because <laughs> that's something that I've lived places that had imperfect glass in the windows before, and I'm, and I really like that you can make the world, you can distort the world in different ways just by the angle that you're looking out of the window. And I also liked it in that it was, uh, I thought, a really beautiful way of talking about being, you know, putting yourself in the writer's seat and how different that is from any other experience. And in these troubled times that we're having, you know, the smartest, you know, the people I respect the most say the same thing that when things go when things are going badly and you feel like you there's nothing you can do that the thing that you need to do is make art is to create things is to actually put yourself into the world in an artistic way and if you're if there's nothing else that you can do you don't think that there's nothing else that you can do you can make art and being creative is the most powerful thing that you can ever do and so i liked that that she, that, you know, she had a line about herself stepping into the, the writer's seat. And that is that. Mm. Nice. I just want to say before, who's going up now, Nathan? Yeah. yeah, but I don't really have a killer one, I don't feel. I mean, you guys have, uh, we've talked about a lot. I didn't want to die today anyway, honey. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 before you go, Nathan, I just wanted to point out that I think Coatsy is the most decorated writer, I want to say, of all time, I think. He's won, like, every award. I think. That's what I heard. Hmm. Yeah, it's either him or Stephen King. I can never remember. No, it's not Stephen King. It's definitely not <laughs> Stephen King. Because he won the Nobel Prize, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, Nobel, Nobel Prize. Prize. everything. Yeah. yeah. All right, okay. maybe it's Nathan. Yeah, uh, uh, I would also just uh, – rec. Uh, well, here, I'll do, I'll do this, and I'll give whatever. Uh, this one's pretty good. It's on 85. And a version came over me that we feel for all the mutilated. Why is that so, do you think? Because they put us in mind of what we would rather forget. How easily at the stroke of a sword or a knife, wholeness and beauty are forever undone. Yeah. Mm. I, like, I like that quite a bit. I mean, it just, that goes to the point of, I mean... I feel like maybe this is super political in the way that it really looks at Friday, just to go more in the direction. Again, it's kind of dawning on me that maybe in Foe, they take Friday's character 50 shades darker than in yeah. Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> um, you know. 
That just reminds me, your line. Uh, did you guys, was, was Friday also castrated? Do you remember the line where he was okay. spinning naked in the cloak? She he does, was, I, I he was spinning, that. yeah. Say, it, it, it could be. But oh, that's right. I thought that he either had been had been castrated or he had an enormous react yeah. erection because I couldn't like she done. was it really yeah. put her off her game. I thought the only thing it said is like something that should be <laughs> something that should be swinging wasn't. Put her off That's why I thought like eh, not swinging. Maybe it's <laughs> right there. I mean, right, really let's go with the erection thing. Yeah, That's better. Yeah, I'll, I'll call erection. Thank you. <laughs> We'll have to wait for the movie. <laughs> Dang. No, I wanted to bring that up because I thought that was incredibly important. Too. Um, and you don't know. It's kind of like, well, whatever. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, caught up in a web. Um, but yeah, was he Was he or was he not? I mean, it, it kind of matters a lot. It can inform a lot of his character if he was also castrated. Uh, if not, and she really saw through for the first time to his manhood, um, that's also important. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not the only time it's hinted at, right? Because if you connect that with all the times she's talking about why wouldn't he sleep with her? Why was he never interested? Mm-hmm. Um, it's more illusion. Yeah, looking at her. Yeah. Could have been that she was white. <laughs> never know. White girl. The only yeah. white girl on the island. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's like that Flight of the Concords song where he's talking about the most beautiful girl in the room. <laughs> on the street. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Depending on the street. Remind me to tell you something when we hang up. When we when we go <laughs> off air. I have to tell you. I'll tell you a very funny story. No record. Right. Well, uh, I guess like still uh, still on the record, um, I would say I would highly recommend Diary of a Bad Year by J.M. Coetzee. I'm not confident enough to really say the Zier, but I think that might be it. So pardon you know um but i i just really like it as a novel and elizabeth costello i really like but for i mean it seems it's not just like a philosophical digest but it really puts in it's got some great dialogue because it's hard hitting it's just really hard hitting um and so elizabeth costello i think is um to really check out cool um, okay yeah cool. all right Okay. Anyone have any yeah, good uh, luck. recommendations? Uh, oh, great. What are, what are y'all reading? <laughs> What's y'all reading? Milton Friedman. Uh, oh, oh man. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> man, that's a... feels so bad for you. Elliot Abrams and the rest of the uh, the U.S. National Security Advisors, yeah. Fun. Uh, yeah, I've been reading all kinds of things, trying to, I have, God help me, I have a few ideas, so I'm trying to research some of those and reading a lot of social theory, and then uh, I'm also reading The Marvelous Clouds by John Durham Peters, which is reacquainting me with a lot of media theory stuff that I haven't read in a few (laughs) years, and I'm really enjoying that, Um, getting back into uh, hmm. No other interesting fiction, I don't think. How about you, you Laura? Mean, um, I'm actually reading uh, Moore's Open Question um, because these turns out a bunch of people are coming over here in about two weeks to talk philosophy. People I don't know, but a friend of my, a friend of a friend, and so these people are coming over and they want to read Moore's Open Question. So I've been huh. reading that. Interesting. Yeah. I have been reading a um, book of uh, short stories, uh, The Gin Falls in Love. The Gin Falls in Love and other stories. It's got a Neil Gaiman story in it. Um, mm. And uh, it's really inter- it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's not, you know, huge, heavy reading or anything. And then um, I read, uh, I wanted to uh, say this, sorry, a little pun here. I burned right through Solaris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and really loved that and um i am reading McLuhan. i'm reading um kind of like you know kind of going around the edges uh <laughs> mm. <laughs> to get at the meat do you think uh, solaris would make for a good talk having read it oh yeah 